Laker fans, stand up. You finally have a podcast that represents you. Make sure you check out Lakers Reign Podcast with yours truly, Nick Hamilton. Every week, we have the latest news on the purple and gold and what's going down on the court. This is Mick Gillespie. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cripps. This is Gabby Reese. This is Nate Boyer. This is Hilliard Guest. This is Nathan East. This is Rob Bell. This is J.R. Robinson. This is Dan Stone. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is James Early, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. This is Kurt Dunaway, and I am listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. We're this celebrating. Is a, this is a celebration episode. Pete and I have been on this incredible journey. Yeah. Been able to find ourselves in places where we just kind of look across the table at each other and go... We're in here right now uh, with some guest who has fascinated us for most of our lives or maybe just a short time, but is yeah. fascinating nonetheless. The kind of people that when we say we talk to someone, the person who wasn't there opens their mouth and opens their eyes and says, really? Wow. That's how good our journey has been. Yeah. It's really lucky. The tone for the quality of that journey was set from the very beginning from guest number one. Uh-oh. Who was with us tonight? Look out! And who's that? Bringing, bringing the break it down show full circle once again, making not his second, not his third, not his fourth, but likely his sixth, seventh appearance on our show, and uh, blessing us once again, uh, the great James Early. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Happy to be here. I enjoy that the first words ever spoken on the break it down show were, "If you grew up in Vallejo, California." <laughs> You knew James Early was bad. <laughs> hey man, who's that guy? Yeah, <laughs> man, it's been it's been uh, quite a journey, and you've been a huge part of it, not just in the beginning, but throughout. Uh, you helped us get some of the guests that we enjoyed so so much, and chimed in on guests that have enjoyed you so much. You helped us do our episode with Felton Pilot. Oh, yeah. That's my teacher. So I, I kind of had to be here for that. So that was my pleasure. Yeah. Episode yeah. with Tommy McElroy. Tommy McElroy. Yes, that's my brother from another mother, actually, as well. You, you know, know what was okay. funny was we pulled up to the place, and you pulled up behind us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were oh, like, right, right. oh, it's Jacques and James. Yeah. yeah. What are you guys doing we here? We didn't bring enough and pies. they were like, we're crashing. Short story about uh, Tommy, I want to say. I was brought in. I met those guys from the industry, really, you know, from Felton and different people, Tommy and Denny, and had been working with them for years at this point. You know, I mean, we produced in Vogue and worked on different things together, you know, and, and become became dear friends. And so we were many years into our own friendship. And then somehow or another... We got to talking, I think, and and um, to make a long story short, I found out that Tommy's mother and my mother grew up together as children in Oakland. Wow. I mean, they were childhood best friends wow. and lived on yeah. the same street and played together. And I, we were able to, you know, Tommy's mother, bless her heart, has since passed away. But at that time, you know, she was doing well and. Uh, I was able to get her and my mother and my mother's sister back in touch, and so they got to talk. It was a kind of beautiful rejoicing That's there. fantastic. You know what I mean? They got to talk and laughed, you know, yucked it up like they used to when they were kids, and so I'm real happy about that. So Tommy, yeah, I call him my, my brother from another mother, and and it's quite literally, literally what it is, you know. No kidding. Yeah. That is a, that's a terrific reunion. I love how small the world is. Yeah. And a lot of the benefit of this show has has come from how small the world is. Mm, for so it sure. doesn't yeah. surprise me that, you know, you would put a connection together like that because you put connections together like that for there mm. are some people who are blessed connectors mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. Uh and and I certainly think you are among them. Mm. Well I'm honored. Man. Wouldn't you say? I, I would say because even how we met was kind of strange. Yeah. You know, and we we were already connected before we met. We were already well connected and didn't know it though. Yeah. <laughs> Chance encounter uh, came from James' brother Jacques, was one of my martial arts students, mm -hmm. and I got pretty attached to Jacques because we had a lot of teenagers in that class, and Jacques was a grown man, and he had grown man geometry, and more importantly, 
what we had in common was grown man flexibility Mm -hmm. or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. So the things that I could see Jacques struggle with, I could relate to because I was like, man, you know, it's just not that easy to throw that leg up that high. No. (laughs) And he and I used to break off into, you know, private lessons almost because I would see him struggling with something and I would go, hey, man, let me tell you what I did and see if it works for you. Step over here for a second. And (laughs) and we had a lot of those sidebars. Mm -hmm. And in the course of having those sidebars, I found a guy who got my jokes, Mm. you know, because you're and Jock's, and my, and Pete's, and Kurt's sense of humor is pretty obscure sometimes. Sure. And we would rejoice in the obscurity. Mm -hmm. So sometimes he would bring something up, and it would be some joke about Boba Fett or something. And I would get it, and we would look around, and none of the teenagers in the class knew what we were talking about. What is that? And we, you know, we we had so many of those moments. Mm -hmm. But I knew that he was Jock early. Mm-hmm. because I filled out his enrollment card. Mm-hmm. He started bringing you to the class, and I would say we were probably, I don't know, six, seven weeks into uh, you being in that class. And then, of course, you being the other grown man in the class, I would gravitate to, toward you just mm-hmm. as I did Chuck. Mm-hmm. And we would have our sidebars and, and you know laugh at stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how I did put it together, but I... I, at some point, I said, wait a minute. Yeah. You are Jacques Early, and you are his brother James. That makes you James Early. That would be my name. <laughs> do yeah. you remember me having <laughs> I, that revelation? Because yeah, I, I had it out loud. I do. I do. And it was very, very funny. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, then, then to find out that you're Daryl Carbolito's cousin as well. Mm-hmm. You know, Daryl, Kenny. Yeah. All kinds of people you had worked with. Yeah. Prior. And my dear friends as well. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, Daryl has been on the show a number yep. of times as well and has guest engineered the show, Kenny which is really, show. Uh, Kenny has been on the show and we've talked about Kenny on some of the episodes he wasn't <laughs> on. But the uh, thing about Daryl was, you know, bringing Daryl in as a guest engineer, it doesn't take anything to engineer this show. It's just, you just plug things together. Mm-hmm. Daryl has really particular and special gifts as an engineer. So to to say that he guest engineered this show, he didn't do anything but bring the stuff so he could sit around and and bullshit mm-hmm. with us. Look mm-hmm. at how pretty Tara Kemp is. Right, <laughs> stuff like that. Yes, <laughs> precisely. <laughs> yeah. um, but those those are the types of connections that mm-hmm. I think run through the thread of mm-hmm. your arc in life. Yeah, and I would say that it's not on accident. Yeah. It's something well, that you cultivate. I'm honored to say I'm honored to say that I actually know quite a bit of people, as we all do. But some of the people I know are absolutely incredible, and I'm you know dumbfounded and honored to be you know knowing them. But to have them actually like me and respect me at the same time, these people that I'm like, I totally revere. You know, it it, it uh is a little bit surreal for me sometimes when I think about it. You yeah, know. when we're in the company of those people, and, you know, Pete and I have been in the company of somebody who you said those things about. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, we and those people are like, you know, James is here. <laughs> we're, about to, we're about to do this with James early. <laughs> but there's something to that, though, like your ability to, to recognize someone's greatness. Mm. Even if you're great, it doesn't mean you hear that stuff enough or that you get to see someone really experience your greatness you know so when, when you do that with someone mm-hmm. and I, I emulate that a lot too like when i'm talking to people i, I like to thank people I'm like i thank sly stone yeah man thank you you know just for everything you've done because no one no one hears that enough and, and i think that that your reverence for other people's work mm. that translates and and i'd want to be around a guy like that I'd, I'd want that person to be my friend because mm-hmm. they appreciate me and not not in a adoration way but mm. like in a professional no way. they appreciate sure. they appreciate the work yeah that's what it is because all the admiration comes from boy you sure did pour a lot into that man mm-hmm. that's what makes it genuine i also want to acknowledge the fly on the wall over here we're going to get him to say something at some point during this show <laughs> and he is uh himself a drummer a, a man of the cloth He's turning red uh, and <laughs> and truly a connector truly a connector okay kurt dunaway yes uh at some point, he, we're going to inspire him to say something. Mm-hmm. Um, he was featured the Times Herald uh, last week. I'm embarrassing him a little bit, but wow. he has done well in his life, and well enough that 
he spends some leisure time during the week mm -hmm. when the rest of us are slaving away at work. Mm -hmm. He uh, spends some leisure time in the, uh, during the week, uh, and he likes to fish. So he's down in the Venetian Marina, which is beautiful, beautiful place to spend some time, mm -hmm. and he's down there casting. He's like the Pied Piper. It's yeah. only a matter of time before people begin to gather around him. And for some reason, people feel compelled to open up to Kurt. And they do, and then he says, well, great. And he gives them some words of encouragement and some words of enlightenment, if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, he's got quite a crowd gathered, gathered around him. And that's what the article in the paper was about. This guy who's down on the marina, and mm -hmm. he's just casting off for fish. And what he's getting, along with along with some r impressive fish, yeah. is uh, he's gathering a congregation. Fishermen who just uh, enjoy what he has to say mm -hmm. and take encouragement from it. Mm. Are you going to say anything, Kurt? Come on, man. So tell me what you would like me to say. Uh, nothing in particular. Uh, well, since you've, since you've touched on my calling, I'll just briefly share. Okay. Yeah, I went down there uh, thinking that I was fishing for fish, but God had other plans and said, no, I'm going to have you fish for men. Just went down there and started encouraging these guys and feed them periodically, do, do a barbecue, and paper caught wind of it. And, oh, boy. And uh, barbecued 120 pounds of chicken and a lot of links and brats and just had a great time. And two weeks ago, had our first baptism out there on the water. Really? And, yeah. So God's doing some pretty cool things out there on Main Street. So, yeah. Yeah. It's fun. I didn't realize that you had had a baptism. Had a baptism. Huh. Yeah. So one of the things that we enjoy doing... Uh, and Pete mentioned we did it to Charles Quinn when we had Nathan East on the show. Was we called Kurt and said, hey, you know what? James Early's going to be at the house. We're going to record a podcast. And he was like, what? I'll come over. And mm -hmm. we said, yeah, you should. Come over. Wow. So here we all are. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to talk about music. Okay. And you did a gig with Rich the other day. We, we brought up uh, our, our everybody's mutual friend, Rich. Did you see that link I sent you, Kurt? Mm-hmm. It's not bad, huh? It's very nice. <laughs> was it Rich playing? It was Rich playing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize. I just found out tonight he was your cousin. Well, he's not really my cousin cousin. I mean, Daryl's my cousin, but mm -hmm. he's not really my cousin. Mm -hmm. Kenny's my cousin, probably more than anybody else. But I have in my life, I'm, I'm very blessed to have 77 first cousins. Wow. Yeah. Um, but the island blood. Though. None of them live here. Yeah. So I've had to just take my cousins in, in periphery, like Kenny. I mean, I think really if you trace the relation between Kenny and myself, we have the same great-great-grandfather, mm -hmm. and that's pretty distant. Mm -hmm. And Daryl and I have, I think Daryl is, we do things gener generationally in my culture. Mm -hmm. So if your cousin is your cousin, then your cousin's parent is your uncle. Now, if it's a second or third cousin, and they're your age, then they're your cousin. But their parent is your uncle. Even though in, I don't know, European conventions, that would be like a third or fourth cousin. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. But if yes. you're older than me, Keep you're my simple. uncle. Yeah. yeah. So Daryl's more of an uncle to you. Uh, technically, Daryl is is my uncle, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we always say we're cousins. But... We always also say we're distant enough that we, if we wanted to, you know, we could get together again. But we, we, ha we haven't yet. <laughs> but we could if we wanted to. Um, and you know, I mean, if Rich uh, is around, sure, I'll claim him just because we're of the same, uh, you know, ethnic heritage, and it's very small. Well, yeah, again, the island blood, so you, you yeah. might be. Do a DNA test and find out you guys are closer than you thought. It's probably true. Yeah. Um, but here's the funny story. When I met Rich, uh, I had initially seen his name on the back of a Bobby, uh, Bobby Brown. Uh, he was on the Bobby Brown Don't Be Cruel album. He sang on it on a song that uh, that was uh, one of the album cuts. And... When I saw the name, his last name is from Guam. It's not, now my last name is of Spanish origin. His is not. His is truly of Chamorro origin. That's my people. Mm -hmm. So when when I saw his name, I was like, it's it's unmistakable. 
And so I always wondered who he was. And so a, a chance encounter uh, brought us together. And the next day I told my dad about it. And he said, oh, where's he live? And I said, he lives in Alameda. I didn't even know he lived in the Bay Area, for one. Mm. I certainly didn't know he lived so close by. And then when I, when we, you know, when we met, I was like, holy cow, and you live in Alameda. Huh. So I told my dad about him and he was like, oh yeah, that's Frank and Julie's boy. Ah. So yeah, Mm -hmm. they, they all know each other. Wow. And we're just the kids who, Mm -hmm. you know, so you're probably right. If we did a gene test, uh, you know, yeah. If you had a sister, I probably should leave her alone. (laughs) That's the point of this. Whole but story. yeah, what a great talent though, and and such a sweetheart of a guy. Man. Amazing, he's an one amazing the, dude and an amazing player. Yeah, and what? it's disarming because if you, you meet him personally, you probably would never know he was even that gifted. Yeah. But again, to watch the guy uh, play is just incredible. How do you describe his gift for drumming? What is it? He's one of the few drummers, and we have uh, a couple of drummers here at this table. Uh, you guys understand, you know, when you play drums, some guys kind of just play the drums you know what i mean mm-hmm. they don't necessarily become the drums yeah. and i think you should there's a, there's bass players that become the bass and you know guitar players they become one with their instrument everyone has that if that's, that's, that's who they are describes and richie that's what people say about james <laughs> yeah yeah richie's one of those guys you've seen him he becomes one with it and it's pretty incredible and amazing to witness and you know his his performance is that from head to toe the whole show you can i mean if you don't even know him you're gonna watch this guy even if he's just a drummer you know he just did a show behind the whispers and he invited me down Uh and i'd never seen i hadn't seen the whispers in years where was it uh down in uh oakland okay no san jose san jose you went to that san jose jazz festival yeah and uh, the whispers were down there. Richie invited me down, yeah. got me backstage passes. I'm so sorry I didn't go to that show because yeah. I had a thing I had to do that morning, and so I didn't make it down to the show. If I had known yeah. you were going to be there, oh. I totally would have canceled the thing. I was yeah. doing going with you. Oh man, I'm standing. You know, and I could have went anywhere. He gave me all access pass or whatever, but I'm standing like right next to Richie where he was playing. And yeah. Again, just watching this guy, I know him, and watching him play, it was amazing. I got chills watching him. Yeah. Man. And he's a, again, dear friend. I get to see him all the time, but to watch him with the whispers and it was a, there had to be 5,000, maybe 10,000 people out there. 10,000 people for him is not, you know, it's not anything. No. He's, he's going to connect that happens all with the time. every person who sees him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's also fun to have lunch with. Yeah. That guy's enthusiasm for life and for food and for enjoyment and just for, he smiles from his feet. Yeah. <laughs> All and this the is say, up, that's yeah. why I think when you say he becomes one with the drums, I think yeah. that's what he's doing. He's he's smiling all the way from his feet <laughs> because the groove happens all the way through his body. Yeah. And when you do something like play with him, you know they got these uh, rooms down at Guitar Center mm. in uh, Emeryville. You could rent a room with two drum sets in it. Mm. We should go down there, Kurt, and we should just chop in this room with two I'm drum game. sets in it. Yeah. You go in there with Rich. He will lay down a groove that is so fat that you can you can sit on top of it and fall off either one of the sides <laughs> for five minutes, you know, just teeter. Yeah. And he'll just draw you back into the middle yeah. and lay you right in that pocket. Mm-hmm. And he never shows off, although he's got tons of chops to show off. Yeah. But he'll just put you right in that place where you can express and you won't miss. Mm-hmm. You know, he. I think that's the thing. That's the talent that he has, that if we can talk about what it is he does to a band and why so many people in so many genres across so many acts love him so much mm-hmm. is because he makes everybody else a better player. He makes you reach for more yeah. and, he, and he gives you that little boost and gets you there. Yeah. And I think that that's probably what you appreciate about him. And yeah. it's probably what you subconsciously do that you don't even realize you do. Wow. Well, that's I'm honored. I didn't know that I did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, you've had Richie on the show, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I'm again, I'm honored to even imagine I'm the first guest on the show, and you've had Quinn and some of these other amazing cats. Man, you know, it's like, wow, what a great club to be a part of here. Well, just but, the Bay Area musicians we've had on, Dwayne Wiggins, mm-hmm. like you, you mentioned, Tommy. Yeah, uh, Dwayne's another dear friend, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Were you there when we met Dwayne? No. 
I was invited, but I didn't make it down. Okay. At his studio. Yeah. 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 I didn't make it. His studio slash apartment. Before we get too far away from this, I wanted to ask you some more about Rich, because he becomes the drums. He smiles from his feet. Mm. Is he born with that and develops it? Is that something that you can build yourself? Well, he has a, he comes from a family of drummers, actually. Yeah. His brothers play, right? And he's the youngest. And he's the baby, yeah. And, and everybody in the family is bad. Yeah. Their father, too, right? Um, is he a musician? Or? I, I don't know if their dad ever played. Okay. But their, their mom and dad both let them all play. And yeah. can you imagine raising three drummers <laughs> in one house? Yeah. We had Brian Dunn on, wooden spoons. Uh-huh. on the show, and he is the same. He's the youngest of three brothers, yeah. and just like Rich. And what ends up happening is the oldest brother will cut the path. Uh, the oldest brother in that family is Gerald, and Gerald is a bad boy. Yeah, he, is. He, he, he is also an amazing player. And the middle brother is Kenny. Yeah. You know, what happens is the oldest brother will, he'll be the guy who brings home the drum set mm-hmm. and starts showing everybody things. And then Kenny will take it further add his own flavor. And I think what ends up happening to a lot of youngest brothers is when you have guys to look up to who are performers, regardless of what it is they're performing at, because mm-hmm. in the case of my, of Nico, he couldn't help it because when he was, you know, four or five, he had Herbie, my oldest son Herbie, throwing heat at him just because. They're in the backyard. You better swing that bat, boy. Mm-hmm. I'm throwing heat. And it wasn't even a matter of he was throwing heat. He was just a boy. He didn't realize he was doing it. Yeah. But the speed of the game that a youngest child gets to experience if the older brothers engage in the same activity mm-hmm. is a different kind of incubator. That's true. Would you guys agree? No, no. An example to that is uh, somebody like Michael Jackson. Ex- yes. Or, or even Donny Osmond. Maybe the know. biggest examples Yeah. are those two right there. Mm. And if you take pretty darn good gene pool Mm -hmm. and a pretty darn good environment and inject it with some amazing input, Mm -hmm. you're bound to get something good, something good, Mm -hmm. not to belittle the hard work, right? But that's what gives the hard work opportunity and advantage. We had uh, Tony Jeffries, a uh, UK Olympic caliber fighter and not he, Olympic caliber. He was an Olympian. Yeah, he won. He, <laughs> he won, won a, a medal. medal. He won a medal. Yeah, and, and never lost a pro fight. He said that he got recognized in the UK as being an elite fighter. So they put him in an elite fighting program. And so now instead of fighting, you know, Golden Gloves amateur tournaments, he's mm. fighting the champion from India. He's mm. fighting the champion from all over the world. And so the number two guy isn't doing that. The number one guy is. And so that guy's got the big brothers are these champions from all over the world in this case. Yeah. And it does elevate your game because either your game elevates with it or you're not on that team anymore. Yeah. So there's there's something to that big brother theory and and how how you get your big brother, whether it's you go to a talent show and Mm -hmm. you get pulled up. Right. Like uh, mm-hmm. Preston and yep. how he went across the country out of a phone book thing and, and, and a newspaper ad. Look, he saw a newspaper ad and Tom Bell mm. was doing a songwriter <laughs> seminar in Philadelphia. Right. And Preston said, I'm going. And Preston was like 16. Young. Yeah. And he went and they started asking for a show of hands. Who came from at least 100 miles away? And Preston was like, I can't hear from Los Angeles. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm raising my hand. (laughs) And he just wore the crowd out. I came from Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty good. Has anybody came here from further away? Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately, they landed on Preston, and they went, boy, how old are you? Mm -hmm. And he said, "Um, I don't know. I remember how old he was, was, but he was a teenager. Yeah. Like, somehow, they let him on that plane, and they probably shouldn't have. (laughs) And uh, wow. juice, a juice box, he's and some Teddy Grahams, uh-huh. and smuggled himself <laughs> onto a plane. We're talking about Preston Glass, yeah, yeah. wow, yeah. And yeah. so, uh, but he ended up with the big brother from that. He you did, know. yeah. I mean, he the, he he attended the songwriting seminar, and then when it was over, Tom Bell said, "You came all the way out here by yourself?" Yes, I did, sir. Mm-hmm. Why don't you come have some dinner with us? Yeah, wow. And that was that. Yeah, and what a big brother to have, Boy. Tom Bell is. He's the guy when it comes to producers. Yeah. Yeah. What did it for you, man? As far as? As far as having big brothers. 
Well, you know, I mean, I've had a few, uh, but my mom, I've mentioned this to you before. I'm going to say I had a big sister first who happened to be my mother, and uh, I was a, a little boy drummer. You know, I played drums when I was a kid. That's That was the thing I wanted to do. And my mom at the time played bass. She played bass and guitar. So I got to watch her, and she was my first mentor in that. I mean, right along with my dad. He's not a musician, but they both absolutely supported me from day one with this music thing and my mom you know she she played bass and guitar and taught me just you know son put your hand there and when I was ready she showed me how to do it and so I had her but uh outside of the family uh you know uh, none of my siblings were real musicians so my first real mentors were just at the school the mu the music programs at the school and I had benefit of that and then also just people in the neighborhood that taught me music and then, uh, you know, moving forward later in life, I was blessed to meet uh, Felton Pilot, as I, I told you before. Yeah, and, he, and brought him to this very uh, dining room table. And Felton, you know, I, you know, even though my dad is my dad, he's my father, love him. Felton certainly is my musical father. Yeah. I call him that, you know, but at the same time, he's a big brother, best friend, all of that stuff, a mentor. Yeah. And he, you know, he's the one who brought me into the technical world, taught me how to be a producer, taught me how to be an engineer and... And I always wanted to learn how, but at a very young age, like I was about 20, 20 years old, uh, I had this person in Felton that met me and really just liked me enough and just kind of like uh, Preston's story, I guess. Felton brought me in. Preston and Felton are actually their friends, too. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Felton brought me in and just like without hesitation taught me everything about engineering and production at a time when nobody else would. You know, you could knock on doors and stuff and people are always like, get out of here, kid, you know, and whatever, go to school and find somebody else. But Felton just took me in and just welcomed me into his home and taught me everything and made me a producer and an engineer in his studio. And then the next thing you know... And gave you the wheel, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. And the next thing you know, he get, absolutely gave me the wheel and... And I'm I'm driving the boat at this point, you know. I'm steering the boat, and uh, he said he told you to build the boat, didn't he? He's like, here's all these cables. We tell you, we built. <laughs> I'm we going built. away for the weekend. Uh -huh, yeah, this thing wired when I get back. <laughs> we wound up building a fleet of boats, yeah. But he, uh, yeah, he taught me everything, man. And then we were lucky enough to, you know, work with uh, not even just MC Hammer and E40. We really, we really started the careers of MC Hammer and E40, and at at the same time, we were able to. You know what? Someone, uh, Jay Logan, another producer in the Bay Area, just yeah. sent me a reminder. Uh, he was thanking me and the other producers that worked on a Spinners record. I forgot that I produced the Spinners back in like 1986 at Fantasy Records. I wow. was a staff producer there with Felton and others. But yes, a bunch of us, you know, we, we produced a bunch of songs on the Spinners, man. James, sometimes right. James is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> he just just remembered that he produced a Spinner's record. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. It, it happened so fast because I was doing so much. A lot was going on, and I'm working with all of these great talents. And yeah, my mouth is open, and I'm dumbfounded, you know, and, and honored to be there. Just really didn't even get a chance to come up for air at the time. But yeah, the Spinner's were one of the many projects. When you are producing for the Spinner's in 1986, you aren't that old. I mean, you aren't that far removed from Marine World. That was your job for a minute, right? Yeah, Marine World, yeah. like washing elephant butts and stuff. <laughs> and so within a matter of months, right, you're yeah. sitting across from the Spinner's who have, ch they're established at this point. Yeah. How do you... Kurt and I are not done with that visual. I know. That's, that's stuff. I'm, st I, I'm still I, thinking I of washing elephant, elephant butts. butts. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was lucky enough to avoid that one. But, but I mean, how, how do you, how do you explain to them what you need from them? As as I know you do it, but like, how do you do that? Like I, I, the the not not even the balls because you got the chops to do it. But yeah. when you sit across from real pros and you're like not good enough or yeah. i need like i want you to think about your bait you know whatever it is how does where does that come from well it's so that, early in the game at that point i wasn't the hands-on i mean you know felton was there so felton uh -huh. was pretty much taking care of that sort of thing and some of the other producers but i was there and i was one of the producers like you know we created the music for the project and yeah got the you know my job at that point was to get the groove right and help with the lyrics or whatever I had to do to get the song ready. Okay. But as far as the vocal production on that particular project, Felton, I think, handled the duties for that. But I, I got to witness see, it. And I got to be a part of it, though. Well, I could see the dynamic with Felton mm -hmm. where you would do something and you would step up 
in some way mm. that was particular to what your responsibility was. Sure. And then you get the look from Felton that says, "That was a good one." Yeah. Oh, keep yeah. keep that up. Keep doing it. Yeah. They yeah. wanted me. I was I was allowed to sit at the the big table with the big boys. Yeah. And I was honored because I was the youngest kid there at the time. Right. And Nobody. the big table was a hundred twenty eight channel SSL console. Yeah. And they didn't kick me out, like I said. Yeah. I'm just waiting for somebody to be like, you know what, you're not supposed to be in here, get out. And it never happened. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, they didn't they didn't want to work without me. We don't want to start this till James gets here. We gotta wait for James to come. And yeah. So. He's watching some elephant butt. As <laughs> <laughs> soon as he gets done scrubbing that down, he'll be, he'll be over here. Yeah, no, thankfully I was done with that by the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 What have you been up to lately, man? You uh, this whole conversation that, uh, about Rich began because you said you recently played with him. Well, I'm in a band with Richie. We're in uh, Richie is this. You super, are annoying. Uh, he's a super in demand musician, but it just so it just turns out that I'm uh, in a band with him, a corporate band. And yeah. We do big events where you know we're wearing uh, suits and tuxedos, but we'll be doing somebody's gala affair at somebody's beautiful mansion in Napa or. We Who just, else is in that band? They just flew us to uh, Seattle. We did a, a wedding up there and, you know, just all these incredible. And it's really a beautiful event to be at. And just to even be there is great. But to be in the and band. And you get to play. And we get to play. And the sound, it's like really a private concert. And that's why it's a big deal. And that's why we have somebody like a Richie Aguan in that band. You know, it's we have to have. Or a James Early. <laughs> we have to have that level of musicianship because it's. A big deal. It's you know, when people big. refer to someone as A and then insert your name, mm-hmm. yeah. he's like a James Early. Yeah. Uh, who else is in that band? Well, um, it's uh, the, we have. Are um, the players somewhat interchangeable? Well, yeah. You have like it has to be because three or four cats that you, yeah, that you can plug in because everybody's in demand. Everybody's in such demand. Like we, even Richie's not always there because yeah. if he's out with the whispers, I mean, the phone. R- Richie's phone is ringing. Richie's phone is ringing. But then we have also uh, Michael Spiderman Robinson who plays keys with us. You know, his phone is ringing, mm-hmm. and he's like a super in demand keyboardist. We have Ken Harrell on the guitar. And I don't know if you met Ken, but you guys should. He's just like probably. Yeah, he may be the baddest guitar player in the world. This guy is the guy, you know, and he could play anything, you know, like that. Where where is he? He's here in, in the Bay Area. Yeah, I think he lives in San Jose. But you got to okay. get him on the show. Yeah, Let's Richie see. and I are doing a road trip to San Jose anyway. I wanted to take a second out of the show and talk to you guys about our sponsor, WeFixYourScript.com. What I love about these guys is they're encouraging you, just like John, Mark, and I, to create something. If you think screenwriting is your thing, or if you've got a script that you're kind of stuck on, this is what you do. You don't got to buy anything. Just give these guys a call. Schedule a 15-minute consultation for free. It's WeFixYourScript.com. I highly encourage you guys to support these guys. Reach out to us. Reach out to them. Reach out to WeFixYourScript.com. We'll go down there. We'll we'll get them. You should get them on. Yeah. Yeah, And then we have our, our lead singer is a young lady named D. Coco. She's an incredible singer. She can. She's another in-demand talent. And, sure. But it's her band. It's basically, it's her band, and she's brought us all together under her umbrella. Uh-huh. Now, What's the name of the act? It's D. Coco and Company. Okay. And, I wanted it to be D. Coco and the Coco Puffs. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> we, 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 we thought about that. Me and Richie were laughing about that, and that was something we were playing around with. Uh-huh. But right now, it's just and Company. Also, uh, we have another singer named um, Lejean. I can't think of his last name. But he is just an incredible singer. So everybody in the band, and sometimes we have horn players sit in with us. Uh, Eddie Minifield sometimes performs with us. Well, he's part of our San Jose road trip, too. Oh, good. That's good. why we were, he precipitated the, the San Jose road trip. Yeah. And then, I, then also Juan Escovito has played with I us. Kinda, but I kind of, but... Juan's going to get in trouble. Juan's going to get in trouble in a minute. We'll talk about that <laughs> off the mic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll beat him up for you. Yeah, we we have the same initials. Please, me, I know me, you, you two are my favorite JEs. I don't know <laughs> if I know another JE, but the two of you, yeah. uh, you know, I associate um, mm-hmm. with each other because there are plenty of pictures from plenty of sessions that you guys have done together. Yeah, Doctor J has JE for initials. Oh, that's true. See, there you go. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there we go. Mm-hmm. And magic's the mirror image of that. Okay. Oh, good one. Thank you. Yeah. You are good. I'm Thank bringing you. him. Wow. 
to my favorite game show. He's going to be on there with me. Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> yeah. Wheel of Fortune. No whammies. <laughs> no whammies. Yeah, yeah. Snoop uh, has that. Has that show. Joker's Wild. He's got the Joker's Wild. Yeah. Uh, That's wow. going to be funny. That I'm going to get Snoop on the show because he's doing. Boy, we're right. just making commitments on this show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about Eddie M because uh, Eddie Minifield was a uh, sax player in Prince's band, mm-hmm. and. In San Jose as well. So he was the reason for the road trip. We're going to go down there and get him. Rich said, yeah, we'll get him. We'll get him. We'll get him. This is one of the best things about what the show's at now is we can get people that are really exciting. But also, because I'm down in L.A., I can have Mark ride shotgun, you ride shotgun. You can bring in Rich and have him sit with you. Yeah. It's really opening up like what we do and how we do it and everything. Yeah. Real, it's real. I'm, I'm excited about it. It is Look, pretty exciting. Let me let me say this about Eddie. Eddie is on my very short list of of another sweetheart of a person. Uh-huh. I think we've mentioned a few of them. I mean, Richie Richie being one yeah. of them. The Escovito family. It's just they're all sweethearts, mm-hmm. uh, and there's many more. But uh, Eddie Minifield is one of them. He is probably one of the best guys you could ever know. And it just so happens he's also one of the most incredible saxophonists that you'll ever meet in your life. Yeah. Doesn't matter who you meet. He's going to be one of the best that you ever meet because he's an incredible player. We all have admired him from his days with Prince. I was my short story about him is I was in the studio in Alameda at the studio actually where Richie recorded with uh, Bobby Brown and all. It's the same studio we were at. Okay. Owned by Michael Denton. You should go interview him. Oh, yeah. Uh, Michael Denton is a dear friend. We say yes to everybody. Yeah. And I was there, and I was at the studio, and I needed a saxophone part done on a song. Michael Denton, the owner, uh, was like, hey, uh, who can I call? And he's trying to, you know, he's going through his book, and I'm going through mine. And next thing you know, he's like, oh, I, I can call uh, Eddie. And I'm like, who? He's like, Eddie Minifield. He kept saying Eddie Minifield, and I didn't know at the time Oh, Minifield. That he was I didn't talking know. about Eddie M. Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, he went by that moniker professionally yeah, for many years. That's exactly. what we all knew But about. his name was Eddie Min- So yeah. he calls his friend Eddie Minifield, and then I'm like, okay, whatever. Eddie, Eddie Minifield shows up, and when he walks in, it's Eddie M. Yep. And I'm like, wow. What I just happened? I didn't even know. And my friend, the owner of the studio, he didn't know that I didn't know him as Eddie Minifield. So anyway, he comes in. Man, you know, and I pay everybody when they come to record. You know what I mean? I don't have a problem with that. Uh, Eddie came in and, you know, I pulled the song up. Eddie laid his part probably in about five minutes. He's one take Jake. One take, absolutely. It just, it was incredible what he did. And I was like, whoa. But when it was all done, I was like, wow, man, thanks for coming through. And you came through so so quickly. And I was like, wow, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to pay you. What, what do I owe you? Whatever it is, you know. And he was just like, no, you don't owe me anything, man. I'm just happy to do I was like, what? I couldn't believe it. He was just, he would not take money from me. He was just like, no, I'm I'm happy to do this for you. He shook my hand, hugged me, and that was it. He just right. he came and played on my song for free, dropped everything he was doing, and I couldn't believe it. Wow. Eddie M. You know what I mean? Eddie M. Yeah. And he's, ever since then, he's just like this. And and again, uh, it turns out that we, me and him, were mentored by the same individual, and I mentioned his name. He's gone now, but his name is Phil Hardyman. He headed up a music program for youth in Berkeley, and I was blessed when I was a child, just, I don't want to be all over the place, but when I was a kid, fourth grade, I was in a music program for kids in Berkeley that actually helped to move young young kids into music and teach them about jazz, mm-hmm. and it was uh, taught by and headed by this individual, Phil Hardyman, who was our band leader, and it was an incredible band of kids that played jazz music. Well... I was in it in the fourth and fifth grade. The talents of a lot of he did. Yeah, I mean, but but I I was in that band in the fourth and fifth grade, and then I moved away. I went to L.A. Mm-hmm. We'll years get to later, that in a minute. Years later, I found <laughs> out that Eddie joined that in like the ninth or tenth grade. Okay, and he was mentored by the same individual. Wow. So and me and since then, me and him both laugh about that. You know, we kind of came from the same place. Yeah. You know? In the formative years. Yeah. You moved to Los Angeles. We talked about this, well, we've talked about this plenty of times personally, but we talked about this on your first appearance on the show as well, that you went to Los Angeles during high school and went to Fairfax High. Mm -hmm. And went to Fairfax High with everybody, with a generation of Fairfax High School students Mm -hmm. that was, I mean, it, it was like the equivalent of joining the Mickey Mouse Club. 
Really? It, it was it like is, yeah. everybody from there in those years branched out to do some amazing musical yeah. stuff. Especially yeah. for that time, that era of music that they represent. Yeah. There's so much power in, in all of their art and what they've created. Fairfax High School, I call it, it's right on the corner of Fairfax and Melrose. Melrose. It's the other high school, it's the sister high school to Hollywood High School. Yeah. And it's probably only two or three miles away from Hollywood High, if that. I just want to acknowledge that it's also right around the corner from Pink's Hot Dogs. I like hot dogs. Mm. (laughs) But but we call it, I I lovingly call Fairfax High School Rock and Roll High School. Rock and Roll High School. Because a lot of rock stars, talents, musical talents, Talents went there yeah. uh, at different times, and I I was blessed to go there. It wasn't Beverly Hills High, but it was it was a really no, cool it was school it was gritty. In. Yeah, you it know, was a really just a great time and a great school. Turns out also Mila Kunis went there also, oh, as good. well as Demi Moore, and they both were married to Ashton Kutcher, which is interesting. And they went to the same high school. They went to the same high school. Yeah, about uh, twenty M- many years, years apart. apart. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But uh, that's interesting. But yeah, when I was there though, yeah, I went to school with Slash. Also, the Chili Peppers yeah. were there as students. You know, we were all kids together, and we knew each other. So when these guys broke out and became famous. It was like, whoa, I couldn't believe it, you know what I mean? Because I knew them as students, and now they're, like, world famous. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, not just world famous, but, like, top five, worst top ten American bands ever. Ever. You know, it's it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. Household name. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm honored. But also the Jackson, the older Jackson brothers went to Fairfax High School, too. Really? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. So when they moved out here from Gary, Indiana, pretty much well, they went right right to Fairfax High School at yeah. that time. Yeah. Huh. How far did they predate you? In age? Yeah. Oh. Not much. Because you weren't but... there with with any of the Jacksons. They're older no, no, than no, you. No. You're talking yeah. about like Jackie. Yeah. And uh, Tito. Jackie's about a decade older than me. Sure. And uh, yeah. Even even Michael was uh, about six seven years older than me, something like that. Wow. Yeah. But still, you know, it was still pretty fresh knowing yeah. the Jack. It was a big deal knowing the Jacksons were there. Oh, one more bit of trivia: the song "My Sharona." Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. The girl Sharona went to Fairfax High School. Huh? <laughs> she she's a real I wonder girl. Where she is? She's a real person, and she was a student at Fairfax High School. And the lead singer from that band met her, fell in love with her, and wrote a song about her. And it happened to become this massive hit. Yeah. She was Who, a student who's the bigger hit, Sharona or Donna? Because that song is huge. That Donna's still alive, right? Yeah, I know what you mean. Donna's like a super classic, though. Yeah. But then Sharona is like the jam. You yeah. Know what I mean? And right. I think forever the jam. Sticky, sticky. Yeah. No, <laughs> Nobody can forget that song. Yeah. Uh, Special place, though. Right. It was really cool. Now, uh, wait a minute, though, because maybe Rosanna went there, too. I don't know that for sure, but it's possible, right? <laughs> Definitely. Possible. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, there are Arquette sisters. I don't think she they went, went away. Perfect. Yeah, they might have been from the valley or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But I think they were L.A. girls. Yeah, that's sure, true. sure. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Knowing what you know about how we do this show, and being that you're really, if we, if anybody deserves credit as a creator of the show, uh, you certainly have have influenced us from the very beginning. Who should be on this show? Wow. We're going to start with Eddie M. So, yeah, Eddie, we're coming to get you, man. We're coming to get you. You got to have Eddie. Um, you got to have the E family. Um, now, this is why Juan's going to be in trouble. Uh, well, no. But we'll talk about we'll that. We'll make that happen. Don't worry. Okay, it's okay. it's going to happen. All right. Even if I have to call him myself. Yes. Um, but um, who else? Richie? I want to make that happen before you leave the house, by well, the way. Well, we talked about Richie enough, but has he been on here? He has been on uh, on here, but he okay. needs to come back because... Yeah. He was so reluctant, you know, because he's such a humble guy. Mm-hmm. And he was like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I have anything How to say. How long did it take us to warm him up? I don't know. We warmed him up. He was episode like 71. Can yeah. you believe, James, that wow, Rich long. took 71 episodes to come on this show? That's a little long. And man. I mean, I barbecued when he came over. Wow. And even tempting him with barbecue from the very beginning, it took him 71 dang episodes wow. for the show. But partly like, in his defense, he is busy. He's busy. He, I was he will say. play totally any busy. gig. He honestly is yeah. that busy. Well, yeah. and then, not only that, but he came over, sat down at this dining room table. Mm-hmm. He was reluctant. We had dinner, loosened him up. 
We turned the mics on, and then he started going. By the time we turned the mics on, it was probably 9 o'clock. Yeah, it was late. At night. He had done three gigs that day, (laughs) and it was Wednesday. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for a guy to be busy enough that he's doing three gigs on a Wednesday, Mm. uh, that was... You know, he came tired. He was like, man, I'm just kind of tired. Okay, we're going to feed you and turn this mic on. I don't know what I'm going to say. So from, I don't know what I'm going to say. I think his show was two and a half hours long. And it's one of the most successful shows we've ever done. Oh, really? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Wow, I'm not surprised. I want to say that his show has had more listens than Stuart Copeland. That's for sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let me, let me say this. You know, I um, I talked about when I, I think when I was on before I talked a, about um, a lot of my history as a producer and all of that. And but I I think I have to talk about because you, you asked what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a lot of live performances, playing with different individuals. I've, um, I'm the musical director now for different shows, or I'm just because the, the band that I told you about, the corporate band. I'm the I'm the musical director for that as well. Okay, I'm the bass player, but I'm kind of the person that oversees the music and basically producing the live performance. That surprises um, no one at but, this table. <laughs> Please well, continue. But what I was going to say is uh, it has taught me I've been really kind of in a way going to school because I've been in the studio producing for so long. Yeah. That what happened is I put down my instruments because I'm a multi-instrumentalist myself, but I wound up putting the drumsticks down and putting, you know, uh, the bass down or the guitar down and, and the keys, I would play it only when I needed to. Okay, there's a song. I'm going to play the song and then that's it. It was no real practicing or anything of my instrument. And I that's a mistake to a musician, but it might be okay for somebody that lives in a studio. And it was. Uh-huh. I had children and, you know, I'm raising my kids and all that stuff. But uh, people would ask me to play live, and I was, I was always like, well, no, I'm busy, or I got to take my kids to school, so I can't do that late night gig, because I got to, you know, take my kids to school in the morning, so I wouldn't do it. And well, eventually, my kids were grown, and I didn't have that excuse, so I uh, reluctantly actually did a gig. I took one, and I was scared to death because I didn't know I had my chops together. You need to quit playing. I could play, <laughs> but I didn't know. You, you know what I'm talking about, though, John. You do. I, I did. Help me out here. I, what, <laughs> what's going on on the other side of the table right now? No, no, no. I didn't he, know if he, I had. He knows my, what I'm talking I didn't about. Know if too. I had my chops together. <laughs> no, I didn't. I wasn't sure because let me just say, uh-huh. and you, you, you guys know this. Uh-huh. The live game uh-huh. is very different from the studio game Wait. because all you're doing is laying a song down, basically a five minute song, mm-hmm. and it's done. Mm-hmm. You know, you play it for five minutes. You might do a couple of uh, retakes or whatever, yeah. and that's it. You know. Even that discipline can be difficult to somebody that doesn't play. But if you do play a little bit, it's fine. But on stage, it's a whole different game. You got to be ready. Some of these shows are two and three hours long. Mm-hmm. You have to be. And then if you add in the there sound is check, there is an endurance yeah. to playing live. If you add in the sound check and the fact that you possibly had to carry in your own gear and all that stuff, it's quite the workout. You know what I mean? It might be an eight hour hit. Uh, if you add in, you know, everything when I load it in and it's and sound check. So it's there's a stamina involved. And right? I'm positive that if right now somebody said, hey, there's a gig in Santa Cruz, you would drive the two hours. Oh, yeah. And do exactly what you're talking about after a two hour drive. Yeah. And then and or longer. Yeah. We've we've all done that. Right. Yeah. And, commute, yeah. yeah. and then the uh, the energy that comes, you have to sustain it for for a long period. Yeah. Quite possibly eight hours yeah. or longer. And it might be, as you said, out of town. You may have to drive to Lake Tahoe, which we've done, right. or, or Los Angeles yeah. or whatever. Get on a plane and fly to some other state or even another country. But let me just say this. Being around these amazing musicians like a Richie, a Guan, or a whoever, it, it, it was like going to school. Mm-hmm. Because you have to keep up with these guys. And as you know, Richie's no slouch. Yeah. He, we were talking about him, but... He's road-hardened, too. 
there's so many more. I mean, Brian uh, Collier, if I'm pronouncing his last name right, from Confunction. That boy is bad. He's ridiculous. Just an oh my God drummer. And so many others. So me as a bassist, I have to keep up with these guys, especially the bottom. The bass and the drums are really one. The, that's the important marriage in any band. Right. That's a heartbeat. Yeah, the pulse. It has to be there, and it has to be right. And if it's not, there's something wrong. And so we have to get along. We better lock when we play. So what I'm saying is this had to teach me. Uh, it was a different discipline, and I had to get into it and keep up with these guys. Some of the baddest keyboard players, we're, we're all playing scales. We're playing, uh, there's key changes that have to be done, modulations that have to be done. Uh, sometimes the, the song is in E and you learned it in E, but somebody needs you to play it in A flat and you got to transpose. And by the way, right after that second chorus, I'm going to get out of your way and I need you to rip. Yeah. You, I need you to solo, mm -hmm. you know, and, and do it right now. Boom. Yeah, yeah. And you got to be ready. And so anyway, that whole thing is like going to school, school of hard knocks. And yeah. I love it. Scared me to death. It would scare anybody to death if you just thrust into it, but it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me. But I really enjoyed it, and I enjoy playing with these guys. And they teach me as much as I might teach them. I probably teach them this much, but I'm learning a lot just doing that. I want to help you out with your thing, worrying about your chops in the live play. Uh, when we talked to Nathan East, he talked about how Chick Corea flew him out to Jakarta. Mm. And he's like, I practiced the whole way because I had to get that step down because Chick doesn't play. Everything yeah. he plays is hard. Yeah. And then John and I are thinking, wait, you played your bass the whole way to Jakarta? What were you flying on? That's a long way. <laughs> and what? how did you take your bass out yeah. on the plane? Yeah. Yeah. It's oh, a, it's one of those planes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's impressive because Nathan Isu, I was blessed to meet very briefly. We shook hands at a, a bass player's musician in Los Angeles about a couple of years back. But I've only met him briefly, but still, I was even then I was honored uh, because he is absolutely one of the best bass players on the planet. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Uh, on a short list, if you, if you name 10, he's on he's that on list it. of 10 of the greatest He bass might be players. three of them. Yeah. <laughs> he might be three, yeah. Yeah. He's high enough on the list that all the other guys at his level on the list, would all they would all defer to each other. Yeah. Like, yeah. they're like, I'm not the best. It's, it's these guys. It's he's guy. that high up. Yeah. And he doesn't need any of the accolades because he's just the most humble, down-to-earth guy and just can play uh, anything. Absolutely. Yeah. I saw him play with Eric Clapton, and he did. He played everything. Yeah. But he also plays it in a way that it's Eric Clapton's show. And Eric's not – you know who Eric puts his arm around when he walks off stage? He puts his arm around Nathan East. Yeah, right along with that, he's uh, pretty much become Babyface's uh, exclusive <laughs> producer. <laughs> right. Babyface produced Eric Clapton, you know um, – not too long ago. Yeah. Fabulous. Change the world. And they become dear friends, but he basically stole Nathan East from him. And oh, yeah. So whenever Baby pa Babyface does a tour now, he brings Nathan with him. That means that Babyface and Eric Clapton and Phil Collins mm. cannot tour at the same time. That's right. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. When you clog up the tour schedule like that, mm -hmm. like uh, Eric Clapton says, hey, so I'm going to go out in June of next year, and Babyface says, I already got June of next year. Uh, all right, I'll wait till July. Yeah. And when we asked home? him about this. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'm going to try to, I'll say the story how I remember it, but basically he was out with Eric Clapton, and then Phil Collins' guy calls him and says, you've got these two dates open on a break with, with Eric, so we're going to fly you. Yeah. <laughs> like mm -hmm. over here. It's like you guys are playing on Friday uh -huh. and Sunday. Can we just jet you to Miami on Saturday? <laughs> you know, and then happens. we'll put you back. Yeah. yeah, it yeah. happens all the time. Yeah, because even while they're on their major tours, uh, the Grammys happen, yeah. right, or whatever, and they have to fly out for that. Yeah, and then they go back and resume their tour. Well, that was happens. the thing about the Jakarta gig with Chick was that it, he flew him out there because he was on the road with somebody else, mm -hmm. and Chick said, "I got to play this thing in Jakarta, and I want to bust out this song, and I need you to play it." So I'm going to send for you. And he was probably on that jet by himself, which yeah. is why he could take his base out. Yeah. So, man, when you get to the point where somebody will say, I'm going to put you on the plane by yourself. Just get here. Yeah. Do me that favor and get here. We're sending a jet for you. Yeah. Right. So just be at the airport in an hour. Yep. And we'll take care of everything. And, and there's guys like that, but there's only so many in the world yeah. that are at that level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can talk about, Claypool or Flea or any of those guys, but you're talking about a handful of dudes that get flown you know, on days off mm -hmm. thousands of miles. It's 
And then to have it be so down to earth and humble. Yep. You know, it's really, it's fantastic to see that. Speaking of which, I hope you get Fleon. Um, Michael Belzeri is yes. his name. Yeah. And we were in band together in high school. I'll never forget. He played coronet. So you, you asked me who you should have on. I think you should have him on. I'll never forget the day, because I used to sit outside class playing my bass. We were in band together. In band, I played snare drum and also bass drum and reading music. And in that same, because it was orchestra. Uh-huh. And uh, in that same band. You guys class, were in the concert band. Yeah, in that same band, he's playing coronet. And uh, I remember when he began to play bass. And so he bought a bass, some little cheapy bass, and he would see me playing the my bass outside the class. And he was like, whoa. You know, I'd be slapping away doing my stuff. And he's like, how do you do that? And I was like, hey, man, check it out. And then, of course, almost like a movie, he looked at it and, <laughs> You know, cut away. I mean, this guy is a revered bass player now, beloved yeah. by the world. Right, right. Yeah. With a large hammering magic thumb. Yeah. So powerful that he really plays lead in that band, and the guitar yeah. often does the bass job. You yeah. know, just doom, 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 doom. Certainly, yeah. Guitar, lead, you know? yeah. Bass is a lead instrument in right. that band, for sure. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So get him on if you can. Let's okay. continue that list. Who else? I would say Stuart Copeland, but you did that. Yeah. <laughs> he is my favorite drummer in the world. I love you, Richie. Don't get mad at me for saying that. Richie's my brother, though, so I can say that. But uh, Stuart Copeland is absolutely my favorite. He was the drummer. first guy, and I want you to help me understand because I don't know. He was the first guy that we've had on who didn't talk about a pocket. He's mm-hmm. like, no, no, no. I'm more Afro beat loosey goosey. I, you know, you can't ask me to do that. I can't. I can't do. And John gave him a. He's like, "What if you guys swap these songs?" He's like, "That's not. I can't play that song." Yeah. So here's a guy that can play all these incredible things and really innovate how these things, how these sounds are created and mm. bring in that Arabic style. In. But what the hell does all that mean? Mm. You mean what he's? Uh, he, yeah, the like, styles. Oh, what what was, happened is yeah. The just very briefly, and I don't know if he touched on that or you guys. I haven't. I need to listen to the show. I haven't had a chance. I'm just loving the fact that you guys had him on, but. I know his life story, and he, uh, his parents were spies, both of them. Right. His mother was a Britain um, intelligence agent, and his father was CIA or something like that, secret Yeah, service. like first generation CIA. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how they met. They mm-hmm. were spies. Like, you know, he's a, he's a real spy kid. Right. They were you chasing know. Boris and Natasha. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so because of that, you know, him and his brothers, they traveled the world as kids. They uh-huh. they, they had to move a lot. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they grew up in a lot of different countries, some Middle East, Eastern yeah. countries, and maybe even in South America, different places. And so he had benefit of that, you know, because he loved music already. He was hearing these rhythms. And learning about different rhythms, you know, than you might learn if you're just here in America. Sure. He was yeah. like, you know, hearing all this stuff. So he used that. And, you know, when he came to the police, to be honest with you, I can hear it. And, you know, he, the way he plays drums is different from anyone. Anyone. Because yeah. he really, he never talked about pocket ever. Yeah. Yeah. And we always talk about pocket on the yeah. show. Yep. If, does he have a pocket? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 But he just doesn't think in those terms. He doesn't think in those terms. Right. Because he is somebody. I well, he to does be. more than more than he probably lets on, but well, he, has to he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to give it much thought. I consider him to be more, and I say this with love. More, I would label him more of a percussionist than a drummer. I agree. The reason why I say that is because he approaches drumming mm-hmm. as a percussionist. I can see that more. So, I mean, he almost sounds like an entire percussion section. Yeah, when yeah. he's playing, he's not just. He's of course he's playing the pocket beat like you said, but he's doing all this other stuff around it. Yeah, all the extra stuff that really three or four guys might do together. But I think it it sounds right now as you're talking, I'm thinking of percussion. Percussion sounds like him hitting something other than the middle of the of the snare. Yeah, timbales. Yeah, he's always he always had those octobonds. Octobonds. You know the thing about his playing for me was when I was growing up, I grew up on all the. All the groove stuff. I grew up on Harold Brown. Yeah. I grew up listening to guys who were helping me make sense of the drums. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those guys eventually led up to Alex Van Halen, who was the guy who kicked me in the butt and made me go, all right, I got to get a drum set now because I think I know how to speak this language. And I got a drum set and I set it up and I put my snare drum right on two and four and built everything around that. Mm-hmm. And then... I heard the police and I went, wait a minute, hold on. I thought I had this figured out. Yeah. This is a whole different language. Absolutely. You know, just his, his, uh, when you take something like, uh, 
Walking on the Moon. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's it's a reggae rhythm. But that was really, for me, my first exposure to putting the bass drum on two and four mm-hmm. and playing around that and yeah. building a groove around the backbeat being at the bottom. And that's mind-blowing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's so different. And, and all kinds of things like just the way that he would splash around on a fill, you know, flada, 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 da, da. And you, you, what are you doing? You know, it's almost like sketchy. Yeah. But you know what? It, what's happening there? And and Stewart, I, I should have really just like you're here, Kurt. I should have been at the interview you did with Stewart because <laughs> I'm probably his biggest fan. I really am. But anyway, what he's doing. You know, I drove to Los Angeles by my dang self. I should have been. In the he car. rented a car. I really drove. should have just I'm, swung I'm by and said, James, you have to you stop have done the game to him. doing what you're doing right now. I'm angry at you for that right now, for leaving without me. I'm pissed off as we speak. But anyway, Stuart, what he's doing is actually, and this, you know, I wish Jacques was here too because he could talk about that. But um, Stuart was. He was basically using his instrument to help shape the songs Mm -hmm. more so than a lot of drummers you hear. And bless all musicians. I love all. But a lot of drummers, you know, they're playing the drums and that's all they're doing. They put a a pocket beat and they're doing a great job at it. But that's kind of it. Whereas drummers like Stuart Copeland and I have to say also Mick Fleetwood, they have this way of playing and adding to the song without getting in the way of the song. Yep. They'll do just the most simple thing even, mm-hmm. but it's at the right place. And it's like, whoa, the little answer that happened. You know, like Sting yeah. will sing something, and then Stewart answers with the hi-hat feel. And you're like, whoa, right? that's really nice what he just did. And he's kind of helping the song speak. It opens it up, especially when you have a three-man band anyway. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of space there. There's a lot of space, but a very important space that needs to be filled in the right way. Yeah, because you can get too busy. Yeah, oh, real fast. Easily. I think Steve Gadd, I would put in that category too, just because he speaks so eloquently and yeah. he waits and saves it. And then when he puts something out there, you go, oh. Right. And suddenly what he had to say was very important. Yeah, right. I like to try to be able to pick out what's going on in a song, mm-hmm. the musicians, the, the, the things that are being played, that kind of stuff. I'm like a song like every little thing. I don't know what he's hitting most, or is there an effect going on in there, like something plugged in? And then I try to think of what part of the drum kit is he hitting, because he's not hitting a drum. He's hitting like the thumb screw that holds the cymbal. It's something like I'm like I can't even place it because there's so many different sounds coming out. So you're right, he does play the entire kit. Yeah, there's like, little tricks. I mean, you again, you guys are drummers. He's using the cup from the the cymbal mm-hmm. instead of actually hitting the the ring, the big part of the cymbal. He's hitting the very mm-hmm. center yeah. of it, yeah. which is a different sound. And he's doing something really special on it. Yeah, he's using you know he's hitting approaching rim shots. it like a percussionist. Yeah, he's hitting rim shots on the snare, and right? Very, you know, thirty second notes, sixty fourth notes, all of that stuff. These accents and very subtle. Where you might, you're right. You maybe you don't even know it's a drum. By the time he hit yeah, it in such right. a way, Richie does a lot of that too. He likes yes, he to use does. Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah. He'll hit the rim of the stick or the side, you know, uh-huh. like a percussionist that might do. That song uh, Rick Murata did that we found that was just him scooting all over the place. It was called Hour That the Morning Comes by James Taylor. And about 11 people bought that song <laughs> when it came out. Uh oh. So much so that when we had Rick on the show, I said, you know, there's two things if you are not familiar with Rick Morata that you have to listen to to start you off. The first, of course, was Peg. Please. And then the second was the hour that the morning comes. And Rick said, now how do you know about that? And that may have been my proudest moment in in, in recent history. Wow. Because, oh, you guys had Rick on? Too? Yeah. Oh. We don't mess around. Yeah, you, you taught us well. You're <laughs> like, here's the bar. We're like, all right, let's get over oh, that. Man, you yeah. guys got to send me a royalty check or something. You guys are like, <laughs> we get super one. famous uh-huh. now. And I, no, but Rick, yeah, I mean, the, the song Peg, yeah, come on. that is clearly, to me, just in my opinion, one of the greatest productions mm. ever. Have you ever seen the making of Peg, yeah. the video yes. that they have on YouTube? Yes. I could. I've, I think I've seen it maybe 10 or 20 right. times. Oh, I have yeah. to keep watching. I love watching it, man. Me too. You know, me too. And just hearing him play that groove, yeah. you know, live up against it. Yeah. And I love the way that he plays. It. I love Bernard Purdy. I love Bernard Purdy, but I love the way Rick plays, plays Peg. Because you can hear them both play it 
in uh, videos on YouTube. And, well, and Rick, Rick Bernard track, plays the heck out of it. But Rick was on. But the Rick track. was on the track. Yeah. And when you hear him play it, you go, "Oh yeah, yeah. yes indeed." Well, then yeah, Ch- uh, Chuck Rainey on the bass. Yeah. And then uh, Michael McDonald on the background vocals. Mm-hmm. Man. And then if you watch the making, Michael was talking about how difficult, how tight that harmony it is. was for him. Yeah. Now you have to understand, and I know you guys do, but any listeners out there, Michael McDonald easily. Is one of the greatest talents that yeah. has ever tried to do anything. You right, know? and for him to say that that vocal was it was difficult, probably the most difficult thing he'd done up to that point. Yeah, is a heavy statement. Yeah, yeah because he can play and sing anything. Well, one one of the things that we is we have uh, two alums from Benicia High who were there. Pat Thurst. When when uh, Benicia High. Back in the day, it was on the TV Twenty Dance Party. Oh, TV Twenty. Yeah. They would they they would feature the TV Twenty Dance Party. James Gabbard. I don't James know if he's Gabbard. still around. No, I don't think. But he, he is. was a genius of Bay Area television, man, and and he needs to be lauded. He's one of the greats. One of the greats. Yeah. The show, the TV Twenty Dance Party, would have a. Uh, it was like American Bandstand or Soul Train. In that there were a bunch of kids dancing, except there were a bunch of kids from one high school. And so Hogan was on there, mm-hmm. and you saw all your friends, and you know everybody got dressed up, and you oh, saw each the, episode actually had... featured a high school. Okay. And yeah. so from that high school, for instance, Hogan High School, they said, okay, and now we're going to feature a band from the high school, ladies and gentlemen, Truant. Nice. And Phil Deckard, and the, you know, so they so Truant played. Mm-hmm. Benicia High had, uh, when it came time to have their band, I don't remember what the name of the band was that you guys had. I don't remember either. It's been too long. But they played Peg. Mm. The nerve of them. That's hard to do. No, it's hard to do because they got the broad strokes right. Mm. They did get the broad strokes right. But that song's not about the broad strokes. It's about the tiny, tiny subtleties and what makes that song so dang difficult, such a challenge for world-class players. You know, I think you've noticed that I, every now and again I like to post on Facebook, uh, I'll do a cover of a song just because mm-hmm. I love it so much. There's no reason for me to redo it other than just that. And Peg is one of the songs that I've done, and I just haven't posted it. But I, I remade it just because I love the song so much. I, it's fun for me now because of technology, but even still, just because I'm bored maybe, I'll be at home and I'll just go ahead and dissect the song that I love and recreate it. I've done that with a few Prince songs and some mm-hmm. different songs that I love, and I did it with Peg just because I love it so much. I love everything about it, the drums, the keyboard parts, the, the guitar chords. Yeah, but you understand that bass part. You understand those those parts individually. In a way that a high school student just doesn't, there's, it's rare that a high school student would understand the subtleties it's in some of those parts. It's impressive to think that a kid, yeah, could pick that up. Yeah. Because it is very, that's a, that's really a complex tune, actually. Derek Jones, we were in high school together. Derek Jones played uh, guitar at the time mm-hmm. and played guitar at, at Kurt's dad's church. Mm. And he spoke through the instrument. With a very, very mature voice. So much so that we would just sit back and watch him. And even if he was playing something simple, he spoke with a grown man's voice. Mm. The rest of us, we were kids Mm. and trying to figure it out and speaking like kids. But Derek has always had a very mature voice. And Paisley. Went to high school with Paisley, too. He always spoke with a mature voice. That's another dear friend. And uh, we just ran into each other at a party uh, about a month ago. Really? Paisley and um, Dwayne Wiggins. How's he doing? And I got to jam with them, man. With the two of them? Yeah, it was crazy. Wow. That was like, whoa. It was like a class reunion. Yeah. Yeah. Paisley's great. Paisley. uh, Man, I miss that guy. I haven't seen him in a while. I probably shouldn't say on the air, but Paisley actually has a really cool job that I'll tell you about later. And he, he could be a friend to all of us just through that. Yeah. Yes. But uh, no, he's doing great. He's a father now and he's happy. Yeah, he's got some beautiful daughters, beautiful family. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's working at Digidesign still? Or yeah. No? Our mothers actually are dear friends now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. You know. Your mother is a dear friend of mine. Yeah. She's, yeah. I love her. One she's of my amazing best friends. Lady. Yeah, my parents, both of them. I mean, as are your parents, just great people. I just, I just met your dad recently. Yeah. Uh, we had. Uh, 
it was a at the blues open mic oh all right yeah yeah that was a lot of fun yeah those are my buddies man <laughs> can't i don't even want to do this life thing without them you know yeah. I mean? yeah so it's great to have them while we do you know what i mean but uh yeah we're rounding third base on this show have we finished off the list is that everybody we ought to have on? We added to it and just you know, there's so many. We should have. Do you think Paisley would do this show? I know he would, but he's he's family. You yeah, know, he, he kind of has to. P, come on, man, come on. <laughs> he has to. Uh, Lewis Hinton. Yeah, yeah, he has to. He is, was. Uh, is E forty family yet? Can we finally get him? I'd love to have E forty on the yeah. show. He's hard to get. He is hard to get. You know what? Yeah. Let, let's He's start super up, busy. Let's start off with getting his father, because you mentioned the blues. Yes. Just now. We his should. Father, who, you know, E-40 is his father's namesake, but um, Earl Stevens Sr. is this incredible musician that I play with all the time. Yeah. So you should, that's who you should. I saw okay. him at that yeah. blues night, too. I've I've known him, you know, I've known him for years. I haven't seen him in many, many years. Yeah. But as soon as I introduced myself, you know, he looked at me kind of sideways and I said, you know, you remember me. He's a great man and he's also a talented artist. You have to see his work. And he's a lot of uh, fun. He should do this show. He'd have fun on this show. He will. I'll We'd talk have a to good him. time. I'll talk to him. Yeah. And we'll make that happen. But if you do that, then his yeah. son kind of has to do it at that point. I'm sure he will. Well, you know, um, I ran into D-Shot not long ago, too. Uh, we just found ourselves bellied up to the same bar. He's another guest that you want. And I said, come on, man, let's do it. And then he got busy. He was like, yeah, I'll come on Friday. And then uh, he got busy and into something, and I yes. you know, stopped calling him. Um, but I need to I need to make that happen. Yeah, We I'm should sure. do it soon. In, in defense of him, he's he is really busy, too. Yeah. yeah. But he would, he would want to do it, yeah. He would love to. He also is really not involved d shot not as involved in uh, hip hop as he was not just hip hop he's not making rap records as much as he's fallen in love with cinema mm. so i i really want to talk to him about that yeah i think so he's a filmmaker he's a bona fide filmmaker now yeah, yeah. and uh, i've watched him again the first time e40 and his family ever came to the studio was with me and felton mm-hmm. years ago we were all kids, and they're they're all, they're all younger than me. Vallejo, California, is a music town. It music is. town. It, it is. is a music town. But be be legit, and uh, E forty and and, and so E-Shot many people in this generation, mm-hmm. the people that you name, but not just them. So many people in this generation will say, the first time I stepped to the mic in a studio, the first time it got serious, the guy behind the console was James Early. Yeah, I'm honored that, but it's true. But, uh, yeah, these guys are great. And um, uh, at the time, you know, D-Shot, right along with a lot of us, were he was a knucklehead at the time, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, little, a little bit of a roughneck. But uh, everybody was, man, yeah. a little bit. You know, Kenny, you know, we could keep naming. I'm talking about Carvalho. Yeah. I could say that now because we're so proud nice. of Kenny. But um, a lot of people, uh, you know, thought that D-Shot was going to go another way. And it turns out he's a very loving husband now. He is he a is, devoted husband, yeah. loving he, family he, man. He actually sent himself to cinema school or film school uh-huh. and took a course, I think, at USC or something mm-hmm. and learned filmmaking. Yeah. And, and now he owns an incredible filmmaking uh, camera, uh, a red camera, which is really uh, it's new technology. Yeah. And he owns one, and, and he can has, use it. And he can use it. He's very good, and and I'm impressed. And so he's working on a few things. Well, he's always been a we're storyteller. Gonna, we're going to be happy to see. Yeah, he is a storyteller. So the ability to understand the craft of story, yeah, that that comes natural to him. The yeah. timing of story. He, he's a very smart man too. So I, yeah, we'll get him on the show. He'll do it. I'll call him and make that happen. And then also, uh, we mentioned somebody else that I really think you need to have on here, and that's that's Jacques. You know, the reason why we know each other. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Uh, Jacques would be a fantastic guest for you. To have. Well, you know what? Twice mm-hmm. I've gotten into it with Jacques where I was like, let's do this with the mics on, man. Yeah. We need to do this with the mics on. Uh, and I know he will. And yeah. I need to, you yeah. know, just keep the pressure on him and go, come on. No, come on, he'd man. be happy to do it. We yeah. just got to figure out a time and make it happen. But he'll do it. Man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, we definitely should. And we definitely will. Yeah. But, I mean, there's, there's just so many people that would be honored to be on with you guys. Oh, come you, on, You guys man. are great at what you do. Well, we, yeah. We've worked hard at it, and, and, and seriously, we've, we've 
followed a great example that you set with us on show yeah. one, you know, and, and given where we are now, 200 shows in, and we were amazed when we got positive K, like we'd like, this will never happen. Yep. And, and we took a shot at it and we got him. Mm. So And had a great time with him. A great time. Yeah. And we, I would love to have positive K on again. I'd love to have Dwayne on again. Cause yep. It's been a while since we talked yeah. to him. It has been a well, long time. Speaking of Dwayne, um, it just we so happens that right I have, I have uh, a niece and some nephews that are these in, that, you know children of a very dear friend of mine but you uh-huh. know just just like in your community i mean this they're like their family his children are my family yeah. yeah and um they were just the kids you know but me and their parents were in a band together when we were young okay flash forward we're all much older now and the kids just decided one day we want to play uh-huh. And at first it was cute. They, you know, we, okay, I'm gonna buy you a guitar, or whatever, and you'll put it down after a while. Anyway, they kept going, and they made a band, and now the band is incredible. Yeah, they're called the Jamming Nachos, and they are badass. And they're kids. Let's still. get them. They're like, they're like around. All of them are like between the ages of like 15 and 21 or something. But you, you really should have them on the show because we love it. they are fabulous. That's me saying it. They're fabulous. No, we They're love, not, we love it's, that. It's not just cute. If they were just that, I might be like, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. But no, they're incredible. Yeah. And it would be fun, I think, for them and you guys for them to be on the show. We're in. Yeah, we love that kind of stuff. There's, they're certainly um, stars of the future. They're on the way. They're going to be the next big thing. But anyway, I mentioned Dwayne because Dwayne, it turns out, is uh, helping develop them now. That's what he does. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. great at that. That is Dwayne's gift. Not, not only making music, but help. Helping cultivate to his credit, young musicians. To his credit, um, Dwayne uh, discovered Beyonce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that. Discovered and developed. A lot of people, yeah, developed her, and yeah. a lot of people just aren't aware of that fact. You know, Dwayne is very sweet and humble, not to even like I'd be wearing a shirt. Look, yeah. I discovered Beyonce. <laughs> yeah. Everyone should know, but he doesn't right. do that. He's just like, hey, how you doing? And like you don't have anything to wear a shirt about. And we don't see you wearing a shirt. <laughs> um, yeah, he is, and a and a great guy. Yeah. He's such a great guy. He is. Um, we do need to get back to Dwayne. Yeah. He was, I think he was guest six. number six. Six. Mm. Yeah. Think about and that. then he came back on another time, and then he came back on another time with Tara. And then the yeah. Sly Stone show. And he, was he in actually, we probably recorded 10 of our first 25 shows at his place. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I remember before we recorded a single show, we met him, and we said, Actually, that's not true. Mm-hmm. We had recorded your show, episode number one. Mm-hmm. And then we met Dwayne, and we said we're launching this podcast, and our very first guest was James Early. Mm-hmm. And he said, oh, he's a great producer. Mm-hmm. And we said, yeah, we know. When are you going to do the show? And he was like, yeah, I'll do it. But a lot of the reason why he was confident enough, he's a kind enough guy that I think, you know, mm-hmm. we, we approached him properly, and yeah. he would have said yes anyway. But... I think a lot of the reason that he was really able to just confidently not having, he hadn't known us five minutes yeah. before he said, sure, let's do it, was because our guest number one was James Early. He's another great guy, and he, just, he doesn't have to be. He's he's busy enough where he just, it, people would understand. Yeah, he doesn't have he to do anything he doesn't want to do. Such a sweetheart. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, just a short story about his sweetness. I mean, and he didn't have to do it. Uh, he was in Sacramento, and I think I was in the area. And Tony, Tony, Tony was coming through to do a show in nice. Sac. And, you know, I had my, uh, a young lady I was seeing at the time, and she wanted to see the show. And I was like, well, you know, and we called, and they were sold out. So I was like, oh. and she's like, oh, you know. And I said, well, wait a minute, I know Dwayne, and I had his number in my phone. She, and I was like, well, maybe I can give him a call and see if I get, you know, me and maybe I don't know. And I called him. And this is only a couple of hours before the show. I'm, yeah. I'm totally knowing that he's probably not going to answer his phone. He's busy. He just, he, you know, he may not even try to pick up the call. Or even if I talk to him, he probably would say no. He's but busy. Anyway, he answered the phone and he was just, oh, Jay, he totally remembered me. It had been a while since I'd seen him. But he knows me. And uh, he was like, yeah, no problem, man. I'll leave some tickets for you and you come in and everything. And so I brought my girl to the show and we're in the audience watching the show. And she's like, she's so happy because we got into the sold out concert of Tony, Tony, Tony. And halfway through the show, man, uh, you know, Dwayne stops the band. He's like, yes, James Early, I see you out there, man. What's up? You know, and I'm like loving it. I'm just like, yeah, this is cool. You know, they clap for me and everything. 
But he acknowledged me. He didn't even have to do that. Yeah. He did right in the middle of his concert. You know what I mean? And just I just thought that was very kind. He didn't have to do that. Man. He's a great guy. Yeah. He yeah. is. And he's helped so many people again. You know, he's a he's a Bay Area institution at this point, I would say. Yep. Who did he get his brother on the show? Yeah. He'd be great to have on the show too. If we got Ray on the show, that'd be amazing. Uh he's moved to Los Angeles. Dwayne stayed here. Uh-huh. So I mean I'm I don't uh begrudge uh Raphael for moving to Los Angeles, but I do celebrate Dwayne for staying here. Yeah, they're cousins too. Uh, Elijah Baker is an incredible bassist mm-hmm. and uh, producer himself. Elijah uh, is the bass player for Tony, 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 and he's their cousin. Mm-hmm. And uh, even though in the studio uh, Ray's playing the bass, yeah, uh, on stage Elijah would always play bass, and, and he wears a vest really well. He's got big yeah. pipes. Yeah, yeah, he's a big guy. Yeah, <laughs> but they, you know, buff guy. But they wouldn't let him play the bass unless he was incredible, you yeah, know. And yeah. all of the musicians, right? Of course, as you don't know, get on that him. stage with him if you, yeah, are bad. So he's another person that you might want to interview, Elijah. Yeah. Elijah Baker. Oh, we don't want everybody. Yeah, yeah we that. do. Yeah. Levi. Hell, yeah, Levi. Where, where you at, Levi? A Richmond boy. He wants uh-huh. want to do it. Yeah. Come on, Levi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know someone who's, who we're gonna get. And, and it's crazy to say this, but then again, it's not. But we've had Brian Dunn on the show, uh-huh. at least in one place. Yep. We're going to get that guy. It what sure about uh, Michael Cooper? Have you had him on? No, but uh, That's happening. we're working on him yeah. in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. We haven't had Michael on yet, uh, but I had Jeff Traeger at this table yeah. last night. And I said, Jeff, who you got coming up? Yeah. He said, I got Confunction coming to the downtown yeah. theater in Fairfield on November 11th. Yeah. I said, call Michael for me. And he said, all right. So we'll get him. We'll get him soon. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. He probably wouldn't mind if I call him that, but he's actually an officer. Michael Cooper. And yeah. I think, I Deputy. Think it, uh, yeah. Deputy, I think it would be right? kind of cool to have him on. You know, yeah. just even if you talk about that, he's a giving, loving man. And uh, one of the, he too. And he'll pick you up and whoop you too. He too. Yeah. He's <laughs> easily, but he too is one of the greatest guitar players. Man. Oh, oh man. My God. Man, we need some guitar players too. Our rhythm section we is do, strong. We got strong rhythm section. Yeah. We're, we're hurting for guitar players. Yeah, I, I uh, was invited to do a show because uh, Eric EQ couldn't do it in Confunction. Michael Cooper and Felton Pilot called me in to uh, sit in for uh, Eric uh-huh. and uh, play bass on a show. They flew me out to Atlanta with them. And I had to, well, Michael was like, okay, come by my house and let's run over the songs and make sure you have it. Mm-hmm. And I think we, uh, even though they had like, you know, 20 songs in their set that I had to learn in three days, I'm cramming. I pretty much knew they were all confunction stuff. songs. So yeah. It's not like you had to learn the arrangements. Well, I, I did have to learn some breaks, some live stuff that they, yeah. you know, they adjusted yeah, the you know. embellishments. But um, you know, Michael Cooper is no slouch on the guitar, and he's sitting there with his guitar, and I got my bass. And even though we're great friends, and he's a, a mentor, uh, I played probably only about five songs. He was like, "Oh man, you got this." Yeah, and we we just sat there again in his house in uh, Vacaville, and we just laughed about other things talked about industry stuff but still when I, we were actually playing and i'm watching this guy and i know his abilities yeah but to see it and right in front of me i mean he is an He's incredible bad. guitar player yeah you know and these guys are a little bit older than us mm-hmm. you know what i mean and that really impressed me too because yeah. i went to go do their concert and again, we're, we're going to talk we're, about endurance. We're performing for like 10,000, you know, easily. This was a huge festival concert. I'm the youngest guy in the band. And, you know, maybe me and Brian on stage, you know. But still, yeah. you, you mentioned endurance. These guys move like they're 17, 18 mm-hmm. years old. It's incredible. This yeah. is one of the great things about our era now because, you know, the guys that are still playing, mm-hmm. they're not using a bunch of drugs and alcohol. You know, right. they quit it for a long time and they've been able to. Right. build an athlete's body yeah. for playing. And so we get to see these guys. I mean, at some point, assuming it, he wants to, and it's set up, basically, we're going to get George Benson. Mm. Hey, he's super old, but he's still out in the road. I mean, he works within his age limits, but he's out actively doing this thing, and he's not just sitting down. He's you know? beyond incredible guitar yeah. player. Yeah, George absolutely. George is like a freak of nature easily. So Yeah, it's, it, it's uh, one of the things that we aspire to, and we're... Well, we talked to Preston, and he he and Preston are good friends and have worked together, mm-hmm. you know, often mm-hmm. um, and recently. So uh, Preston was going to help us try to get him and kind of nudged nudged us his way. So we're working towards it. Mm-hmm. 
I will say the other guitarist that I'd really like to have on the show is Ray Parker. Mm, that's a good one. Because that boy is bad. He's got a story to tell you. He, too, is a multi-instrumentalist. I mentioned that word because I, I, I'm i a bassist, but I I play guitar and I play other instruments. and I consider, All of them. I consider <laughs> myself to be a little bit of all of those. I, I, I don't even want to just say I'm just a bassist because I'm not, really. And and uh, Ray Parker Jr. was probably right along with Paul McCartney and Prince and Stevie Wonder. He was one of the first people that I witnessed play everything mm-hmm. on his records. Yeah, because a lot of people don't know Ray Parker Jr. is playing all the instruments on uh, on Ghostbusters and yeah. Jack and Jill and all those other great songs that he did. You know, even Mister Telephone Man, that's, right? That's him playing everything. You know, the other woman. Yeah, uh-huh. the other woman. That yeah. was a bad cut. Yeah. Not only that, but I mean, you know, he played with Herbie Hancock. Mm. He played with everyone. Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Um, he was an in demand guitar player uh, when he was like nineteen or twenty. He right. came from Detroit, and he came from that school of where pretty much everybody was incredible. Mm-hmm. So you had to be incredible to be a part of their circle. Yeah. Or you weren't part of their circle. Right. You were outside of the circle. But he was one of the youngest. Uh, certainly, you could consider him to be a child prodigy. Because I think right out of high school, they were just like, we got to have this guy on in the studio playing on hit songs that weren't yet hits. Of course, they were made, and he's the guitar player on it, and then it comes out and it blows up. So he's he's got a, a story to tell you. Yeah. yeah. So he was, yeah, Stevie Wonder had a band called Wonder Love. Ray Parker Jr. was the guitar player, one of the guitar players for Wonder Love uh, in the very early 70s. Mm-hmm. That would be fun. Yeah. That would be fun. This has been fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this ride that you've helped us go on, nearly 200 episodes now, yeah. has been a lot of fun, and it started with your encouragement. Well, so. here's to another 250 or, or 2,000. Yeah. You know, you guys are uh, just beginning, but uh, you know, look, you guys are going to have a TV show really soon. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? You guys will be like Oprah Winfrey. You'll be billionaires one day. And I okay, say, take I it to, easy. I used to know them way back <laughs> Take when. it easy. This you know what? If financial starts. success comes to us like that, you know what we're going to do? Yeah. We're going to go down to the pier and fish with Kurt. Come on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You know, when you launch all these careers, I was there when, you know, Mac Dre grabs Mac, whoever it's going to be, all those people that are out there. Yeah. You know, we're, we're in that group now. Like, you've helped kind of nudge us to the point where legitimately we're talking about Daryl Hall. You know, we've got our hooks into Herbie Hancock. We don't have them yet, but... I'm not going to, we talk, John and I talk about all the time. You can say almost any name now, and we're not going to be surprised when we get that person. Mm-hmm. Because we built a show that it's. We went to Stuart Copeland's house. Yeah. Oh, wow. Rick yeah. Morata's house. We went to Rick Morata's house. Well, and Rick, let, let me say that you guys are intellectuals, and um, let, let's be honest. I mean, there's some people that are doing these shows or blogs or whatever, they're not interesting. They don't have they don't know how to talk to people. They don't have good questions. They haven't done their homework. They don't know who they have in the seat. And that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But you guys are smart guys. And these are who I think anyone would want to talk to. You know, you you guys are the guys that people would want to talk to because you make it fun. And again, you've done your homework, you know, so much. And you at the same time, you let your your uh, guest be a guest, you know, let it breathe. And uh, that's uh, kudos to both of you to be great interviewers is quite a talent. You know, thank you. Thanks, man. Yeah, that means a lot. I think that's that's where we stop.